Hi guys, Michael McPherson here. I hope you're all doing good. You join me today for something really special. I'm chatting with the legendary Steve Perriman. Steve Perriman is Tottenham Hotspur's most capped and most successful player. He's had an incredible career which has spanned from playing to managing and even into the boardroom. He's a man who's dedicated his life to the game he loves and this is his life in football. Steve, thanks for joining me today, mate. Absolute pleasure. My pleasure to be talking in front of you. Yeah, very special show today because usually we do this MHM social and it's a bit of a chat, but it's impossible with someone like you, with your history in football, 52 years, I believe, to condense it. So we're going to do our best today to try and cover as much as we can. Um, funny thing is, it was a year ago today that we were actually together at the Tottenham Legends event in Harlow. Um, and I remember yes. having a joke that night saying that I'm going to have to change the first prize of the raffle from the Gaza signed shirt to some hand sanitizer because all this coronavirus stuff just coming around but yeah. seems like a bad joke now it probably was then but uh it's yeah it's sure. been a, it's been a crazy year mate it's been a crazy year but you're keeping well keeping very well um my wife and i actually have had covid uh but we when we talk about it we say that we've had worse colds but all in all we we've moved during the covid period from devon to wiltshire mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to be halfway back to London. Um, I wanted to be closer to my family who live on the west side of London. Yeah, my time at Exeter was done. I uh, had about 16, 17 years there as director of football. Enough was enough. Decided to retire. And uh, just looking forward to settling in, getting to know the locals. Of course, neighbours are great. Uh, Bristol City support, mind you. But um, yeah, all, life's good. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. You're gradually getting closer back to London. That's what I, I can tell. You're gradually trying to ease your way back there. But we'll start in London today. We've got to start in London with your time at, at Tottenham. 854 first team appearances. I mean, that's a number that you can throw out without really realising how many it is. 854, all your success there, most appearances, most trophies by any player at a club. Yeah, I think it was, was it 17 years in total there, all the different managers and stuff? Mm. I got in as a 17-year-old. So I was actually at Tottenham for 19 years. I had two years as an apprentice, but you signed from school at 15. Um, lucky enough, I got in at 17. And, you know, it's very unusual to be in Tottenham's team at 17 and then actually to last that long. Now, I'm not a goalkeeper. You could say, people ask me, do you think anyone will ever beat your record? And do you know what? I'd be delighted if they did. And I'd be especially delighted if it was Harry Kane, because mm. it would mean that he's still there. It would have to be a goalkeeper, probably homegrown, who gets in, say, be, maybe 18, 19, because goalkeeper is a, an experienced position. Mm. And goalkeepers can last till about 40. And they don't often go off injured, do they, goalkeepers? It's sort of taken as read that, that that you know you, they don't so I think that's what it would take for someone to beat my record why did I play so many games well I answer that question by saying because I played so many games and I think that the answer to that is really I'm saying the more consistency you get into playing even mm. if that consistency is Saturday Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, etc. You're in a flow. Yeah. I don't think my body could have coped with three games, have a rest. Four games, have another rest. Uh, this is only the League Cup, so don't play this one. I don't think I could have coped with that. Mm. And the fact that I didn't really pick up, I certainly didn't have any major injuries, but I didn't have any hiccups in my career. Because once you start, you, what I'm trying to say is you need the wheels of your body to keep turning. And I would have preferred to play than train. So to play those games, I, you know, my, I think my, my most appeared season was 66 games. Now that is an incredible number. Yeah. And that year, because of certain success and because of a bad winter with games being off, we played the last 10 league games in 23 days. And I played every one. Now, that's almost Incredible. play, day off, or recover. Play, recover. We certainly didn't do a lot of training then. Mm. And at the end of it all was the, um, uh, was the 82 Cup final. So, you know, we should have beaten 
QPR the first time where we didn't, I think because we were tired. And yet, you know, there's still one more game to play. And then eventually in the replay, we did win it. Yeah. But uh, that was the end of a mammoth season. And I still say that I wouldn't have liked to have been part of this, um, you know, where the manager changes the team around according to the how he sees the importance of the game, importance of the competition. Mm. And you're in, you're rested, you're out. No. No. So I was very lucky with injuries. Um, so that goes along with what I've just said. I wasn't interrupted by, yeah. you know, being out for a month and then coming back for two games and being out for another three weeks. Um, that is partly due to luck, partly due to my body. Um, I think my body was as robust as anyone, mm. albeit I wasn't quick. Um, I wasn't tall. Um did you but, work on that, Steve? Did you work on the fitness aspect of it? Was it something um, you was aware of? Just the normal regime at Tottenham. When I joined the club as a 15-year-old, you, you, you did a lot of it with the ball, but you ran and you ran and you ran some more. And nobody ever asked you if you were tired. Yeah. That was the last thing. And I always tell the story about Bill Nicholson coming into the treatment room. And you might only be in there having a strap in or whatever. But anyway, there was four beds and he'd walk in and immaculate creases down his trousers, his, his part in always immaculate, mm. shoes, perfect. <sighs> and walk out. No, <laughs> how are you? No sort of tough love, if you know what I mean. So his message really was, you're injured. You're no good to me. Yeah. I better go and deal with the ones who can get me the next result. So it, there, there was an attitude of get on with it. Yeah. I can understand that from what their age group, Bill Nicholson, Eddie Bailey, the various, um, their choice of staff behind the scenes, you know, knew about the Second World War, knew about how it was to live with rations and mm. and get your head down and just work. Don't, you know, tired. You're tired. Can you imagine telling Bill Nick you're tired? Well, <laughs> well, it took your head off. So, um, so within that playing games, I was consistent. Um, why? Because I think I've got a football brain that. Of course, you're a product of coaching and good direction from, from your coaches. Uh, but there's also a certain element that you learn from doing it a number of times. Yeah. So you think, I won't do that again. And guess what? Over the course of time, you at 27 years of age, the game is never easy. Let me tell you that. It's never easy. Mm. But about 27, the game came like an open book to me. I knew what was going to happen next. Yeah. So you're moving before the ball goes there because you've seen it a number of times. Now, of course, there's always the surprise element. Of course there is. You're playing against George Best. Mm. <laughs> he can surprise you. Guess what? He don't do normal like Gaza or the, the real special talents. But in general, you could, if you had a brain, if you thought it through, if you prepared yourself, if you prepared your body right, because there's a, a level of fitness built up in you through playing a lot of games. And remember the, the crap pitches we played on in the 70s. Yeah. I mean, it was like almost like playing on a beach. And if you ever want to run, now you can run on nice grass or you run on the beach. Guess what makes you more tired? That actually gives you stronger legs. Yeah. That gives you stronger legs. And therefore, if you just catch a tackle wrong or whatever, your body and your knees and your muscles are able to take that bit of a different tackle. I was lucky enough to, to have a great piece of advice from my oldest brother, Ted, who was only four years older than me. Um, so when I was about 10, so therefore imagine this advice from a 14-year-old brother who wasn't a coach, who certainly wasn't a teacher mm. because he's 14. He said to me, Steve, you'll be a better player when you realize that if you advise the player in front of you mm. what he can do, be it can turn or there's a man on or shoot or any of that stuff, it makes you a better player. Yeah. And 
keeps you more involved in the game, which which it obviously does, because you know, twenty two players over ninety minutes, you actually have not got that long on the ball. So you've got to do more than on the ball. You've got to do off yeah. the ball and voice as per my brother highlighted. But the very important thing he said was, Steve, that's not because your mate is a bad player, not because you're a better player than him, but because he hasn't got eyes in the back of his head. Therefore, like you do when the ball's coming to you, either by surprise or design, you sometimes need help to tell you you can turn or, yeah, you can shoot. Or it, Steve, give us it back. Oh, there's a man on you. So so the, the, the leader bit, he, he gave me the sort of pass to go and be a leader. Yeah. And once you realize what it can do for your teammates, maybe they're going to do the same back for you. And actually, you, you get a sort of an opinion on the game. And when we talk about there's no talkers in the game anymore, there's no leaders. Well, guess what? To be a talker or a leader, you've got to have an opinion. And if there's not room to have an opinion, guess what? There won't be leaders or captains anymore. So um, basically what I did was, I, without knowing it, but now I'm looking back at my career. Yeah. I made myself selectable. Yeah. If you were the manager, you would want to pick Steve Perriman because consistent, never, never nine to uh, 10 out of 10, but never a four or five either. So yeah. six, seven, maybe an eight, but consistent. Uh, I was, I was pickable because I was fit. Uh, I could lead others and add to their game. The advice that your brother Ted gave you there kind of may have answered one of my questions, which I was going to say, when you look at all the players that you played with in that time, the players that were there with you for a long time, the players that came and went and all the managers that selected you, I was going to say, you know, what do you think the real talents were that made you selectable to everyone and made you you know, work with all those different teammates? But maybe it's what you offered them. Like you say, the fact that you were willing to sort of say, man, on look this way, look that way. You know, you need to do this. You need to do that you probably made the players that maybe be playing seven out of 10, eight out of 10, which in, in turn made you a nine or 10 out of 10 by offering them a bit more. It's, it's a really interesting bit of advice that. Yeah. I, I think it made me unselfish. Mm. I, I, to be, to be honest, I think we're a product of what we're, who we're surrounded by. So for instance, I'm the youngest of three boys. If my two elder brothers Instead of saying to me, come on, you're coming with us. Where are we going? Uh, Brentford one week, QPR the next. Hmm. Instead of saying that, they say, come on, let's go and raid the sweet shop. <laughs> then I'd have ended up a bit like that, you know? Yeah. Let's find a, a tricky way. Yeah. But they, they sort of pushed me into, um, into watching football and a desire for football and then a, a, a desire to want to improve and get better. So uh, I was very lucky to have these two wonderful brothers, I've got to tell you, and not an ounce of jealousy. It was only ever pleased for me to be hopefully successful at doing what I was doing. The second one, Bill, um, we opened sports shops when I was 19. So we ended up having six, seven, eight in West London area. If I knew I was going to be at Tottenham for 19 years, <laughs> I could have had one in North London, trust me. They give you a lot and you sort of manage to give them something back. You yeah. know? And, and, I, and I'm sure they'd be immensely proud of you for the career you uh, you went on and had. I'm, oh, I'm that, absolutely sure. Uh, of that. Absolutely right. I want to talk a bit about um, you being a homegrown player. You know, you started at a very, very young age at Tottenham before making your way into the team and having that absolute brilliant career and longevity there. Um, it's almost the perfect example of what academies are for and bringing through players. Do you think we've got um, a good balance of that now? If we look at the England team that's going into the Euros, full of young talent, probably more than we've had in a in a long time. Do you think clubs are finally getting that balance right again? Yep. I think that um, you're speaking to the right man about homegrown talent because I am such a fan of it. Where would Tottenham be today without Harry Kane? without his goals mm. and I'm saying all the time to Spurs supporters if the first 20 times you saw Harry Kane you thought he was going to end up as good as he's turned out to be I'll call you a liar because you never yeah you thought he was sort of average might be all right etc 
given time, he's turned into one of the best strikers in the world. Um, if I think about the best player I've ever played with, that's Glenn Hoddle, homegrown, homegrown. The best player I played against, George Best, homegrown. Yeah. That's a bit of a tricky one because if anyone says they produce George Best, again, it's not quite right. George Best produces himself. Is that yeah. super talent? And that there's very few of those around. But but if you get my point, um, I think it was nine of the the sixty six World Cup team. Nine of them were at their first club they'd ever signed for when we won the sixty six World Cup. They probably moved on after. Uh, I'm saying to Spurs supporters all the time or judges in the game, do not undersell, do not undervalue homegrown players. They do not have to be second-class citizens, second-class ability, because as I've explained, Glenn Hoddle, Carrie Kane, George, George Best. Best. If you think about leaders, and I think this is really important for a captain choice, when you think about leaders, I don't like mentioning these names, to be honest, but John Terry and Tony Adams are two of the best leaders you'll find in, in modern day football. Yeah. So why, why are they so special? Do you know what? Because like me, and I'm not saying I was special, but like me, they're the link with a crowd. You learn very quickly what that crowd expects of the team. Mm. And it's your job to put that across to the players when you, you're in at half time and you're sat down and you ain't been great and you can feel the crowd's sort of uneasiness with you, mm, we definitely ain't at it today, you know. And I, I think they're channeling that through me. Steve, you need to get at these. Of course, the manager's job, the, the coach's job, of course. But you've got to have someone on the pitch that sort of can relate to the, to the crowd. And um, so being homegrown probably means that you understand your club better than anyone. Yeah. Of course you can sign great players, Ozzy and Ricky. Well, don't tell me they weren't quality. Well, they are. It was my job in a way to let them know what was expected of them from a Tottenham crowd. We're not playing for Man United. We're not playing for Liverpool. We're not playing for them down the road. We're playing for Tottenham Hotspur and they love a bit of this. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like that. I said to someone the other day, uh, this was explained to me, that if you're 1-0 up and you're playing for Arsenal and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're wearing the red and white shirt, you're 1-0 up and you pass the ball back to your keeper, you got a round of applause. If you did that at Tottenham and you're 1-0 up, pass it back to your keeper, they booed. <laughs> so, so, and that's not to say either's right or wrong because yeah. it's the way your club can do it. And you would always have to say in my time that, that Arsenal were always more consistent than us. We probably reached eight, nine out of ten more times than they did. But they were seven when we could be a three or four. Yeah. Exactly what I'm saying about my own consistency. So um, I was always constantly calling for more consistency out of our players. And... Um, and yet I knew that Tottenham supporters reacted great to Glenn Oddle when he had the ball. When he had the ball, I went to take a corner. It was about 3,000 people. If they were sat down, they'd all stand up and applaud him. For great player. Taking the corner. And Ozzy, they adored Ozzy. And so you, you know what your club stands for. And that's yeah. not right or wrong, but it's what your club does. I think I think what you say is absolutely spot on and, and you know it's a view that I have on it. I think your your signings need to be your sprinkles, your icing on the cake. You need to have the base of the homegrown players. Like you say, yes. if you've got a lad who's been at the club since his early teenage years or mid teenage years, he almost when he comes through and he's in his twenties, he's playing for the first team squad, he feels a sense of pride to it, like it's his family, like he knows everything about the club. He knows the kit man, the fans, you know, the managers. Sure. He, he wants the players that come in to play for the club in the same way he does and have that same passion for it. And like you said, it can, they can pass on the club's ethos. So yeah, I think it's um, absolutely spot on what you say. And I do think it is something that is starting to, we're starting to go that way again. Now I do think homegrown players, we went, we went for a spell where clubs would go, well, we'll just spend 30 million on someone in the market and they'll fill a gap at left back for a little while. Cause the fans will be happy because it's a big name. 
And then off the back of that, someone would lose their spot who's been there seven years and, you know, there's no coming yeah. back from that. So I think we're in a good certain, place now. And it doesn't always work out. You okay. buy 30 million as against that one. Say, for instance, and I don't like naming names, but for instance, the right back, they let go to, uh, to Spurs, I'm talking about. Mm. They let go to Southampton within that deal for Hoiberg. And mm. it looked like a really good deal. Well, they might have to bring in another right back <laughs> to get the right one. And actually, that lad at Southampton's doing really well. Yeah. So is he any worse? Well, I don't think he's worse than what we've ended up with. Two right backs who, of course, cost money. Yes, they've got more experience. So that's what the club was paying for yeah. uh, with Aurier and, and uh, Do- Doherty or Doherty. Yes. So, um, but homegrown, just take your club a bit more serious. That, that's what I would say. And you look at the talent now that is homegrown in England, putting us into a position of getting to the Euros. Guess what? It's a combination of all those things. Experience, pace, height, heart. If you strip it right back, every player that you've ever fancied was homegrown somewhere. Sure. Henri, Henri, or, you know, all, the, all these wonderful players. They're all homegrown somewhere. Yeah. Puskas, but in the old days, all homegrown somewhere. So it doesn't mean to say because you're homegrown that you're second class. I think uh, from there, actually, I want to move on. We spoke, you talk about the affinity you have with, with London and, and North London. And, you know, it, it kind of makes it even more bizarre that you ended up in, in Japan. That's such great success there. How did that move come about after you got into management? How did you move across? Yes. Um, so player manager at Brentford then on to Watford as manager. Then I decided to go with Aussie as an assistant, which is a real big decision. And I would have only made that decision to go from a manager to assistant manager, one for Aussie and two because it was Tottenham. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that was in the sugar years. And um, this was not the same club that I'd left. This was not the same ethics, the same morals. Mm. So... We didn't match uh, the, the sugar way with Ozzy and Steve. Didn't match, and therefore we were we were moved on, which is fine. I think Ozzy invited me to Japan. He got offered the job in Japan. I think he offered it to me for us to prove that we were good enough to do a similar thing at Tottenham. Yeah, if we were given time. So. Um, we took over, Aussie was manager, I was number two. We took over a club that was the least powerful in the league. All the other clubs were owned by the big corporations, Hitachi, Toyota, et cetera, et cetera. And we were like the makeup club of the league. And it was the license was given to an area. So it was a community club. So we were about half as well, not even half as powerful. And um, I have to say Aussie was magnificent he got this group of people together he said to me steve after about after about a week steve we got less money we got less power than the others so we got to be more clever yeah we made that group of people into like a family and no one had done that in in japan before Mm. we would invite them to like a karaoke night and then the players would turn up on their own we would think that they'd bring their wives with them Where's, where's your wife? My wife? Yeah, it, it, for you and your wife. Ah. And then on another evening, you make sure you put that right. And then, you know, say it's a late afternoon one, we'd say, where's the children? My children? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Aussie played such an attacking brand of positive football. We took it by storm, by storm. All the other clubs are employing Leonardo, and who ended up going back to Italy, probably, uh, of, of Brazilian. Yeah. Uh, and Dunga and all these famous names. And we had sort of not well-known Brazilians. We had three. and um, But all joined in together, all proper people. So we had success. And that's how you get success. Create the right environment. I'd love to see a picture. I hope there is a picture somewhere of you and Ozzy surrounded by all these Japanese players and people doing karaoke somewhere out there because that would be brilliant. Uh, he used to sing 
I've heard it a million times. He used to sing my way. And actually, that's what Ozzy stands for in football. Do you know what? I'm going to do it my own way. Very and true. yes, it didn't work at Tottenham because we didn't have time. And it was such a different place. But um, it worked in Japan. We got them up to the league champions. We won the League Cup. Um, when Ozzy left after three years because he wanted to get back in European football. Uh, so he went to Croatia. I took over the job. And then we won the league and we won the cup and, and ended up playing in the World Club Championship. Do you remember the first one where Man United didn't play in our FA Cup? We were one goal away from being in that tournament. We, we had a tricky ref in Saudi Arabia. Say no more. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, that, that's how you can progress. The, the great thing about the Japanese is they want to learn. Yeah. If you... If you're 70 years of age in Japan, I think I'm nearly 70 and you're thinking about winding down and going for the easy life in Japan, they will probably take up a new musical instrument, a new language, some yeah. sort of new skill. Cause actually they're thinking 70 years of age. I've got about 30 years left. You know, what how am I going to spend the 30 years? Yeah. So they're a very, I, I, we loved our time there. They were special people. The players knew they were the best in their own country, but because of the TV coverage coming in from Brazil and Italy and Spain and the premiership, they knew that they weren't good enough. Mm. So every bit of advice you gave them, they sucked it. They had more and more and he wanted more advice. They wanted to stay at the training ground forever looked after their bodies, having sampled what we sampled in Japan for those five special years, three together. Yeah. It was a magnificent place. I can imagine. And I was going to ask, um, you know, you go there and it's so different from, from this, this culture and, and here and the language is so different. Did you use football as the kind of common ground? Is that how you kind of found that kind of a, adapted to the place? How you found the kind of understanding yeah. with the players and stuff? Because I imagine when you were outside of the training ground, outside of the stadium, you know, it must have been quite, quite bizarre and quite different. But when you're there playing yeah. football, football's the same all over the world. Yeah. Well, remember, we had, um, we had three Brazilians. So me, Ozzy, our families, the Brazilian families, some of the Japanese. We'd all join in for like a barbecue every Sunday. So you play mm. Saturday barbecue um the karaoke thing put us all a little bit tighter together as well that's the japanese and the, and the foreigners that are there yeah. um remember it is such a respectful place when you are when you've been brought in because of your knowledge guess what they listen to you mm. be it the owners of the club be it the directors of the club be it the players of the club be it the captain of the club Sensei is a very important word in Japan. You know, sensei is the the, the judo coach, yeah. is the teacher. The you 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 are the man, and we follow you. That is a great feeling to have. Yeah, we super. follow you, and you know, Ozzy used to talk to him in meetings about. I I want you all. When we took over, we had none in the, the Japanese national squad. By the time I'd left, uh, we had six in the um, 2002 World Cup squad from our team because of the success. So as I used to say to him, every, every video, every talk, every meeting we had, it's a, I want you all in the national team. I want these three. He called them like a swear word because they loved it, the Brazilians, these three efforts. I want them in the Brazilian national team, which weren't ever going to happen because they was like a sort of second class. I didn't rate them second class, but they rated themselves as per the, the big names, yep. Zico and all that. And uh, I want you three in the national team. We're going to do our work together. We're going to get results. People are going to take notice of us and you're going to get caught up. Well, actually, it never happened to the Brazilians, but it did happen to the Japanese. So I, I am so proud of what we did there. And Ozzy led it. Ozzy drove it. I sort of had to carry it out and then carried on his good work. I said to the players when I took over, I'm probably about 10% different from Ozzy. So 
90 percent the same 10 percent just steve's way and is this is this a criticism of was it no the manager decides yeah. i was his assistant i follow like you follow us i follow him and now i'm gonna lead it so when we had three years there together, our families, it was the best three years of our life. It was magnificent. And my wife learned Japanese in 18 months. Uh, my two daughters, we took a six-month-old daughter there. We had another daughter while we were there. They both had to go to Japanese school because we were too far from Nagoya, too far from Yokohama, Tokyo. We were right in the middle of it, around about Mount Fuji area. So they had to go to Japanese school. My wife wanted to converse with the teachers and the mums and the, wanted to buy the bread and the meat. And, you know, so uh, I was too lazy. We all had translators. So that should have made it easier to learn, but it didn't. I was going to say, so, did, you, um, uh, did you learn to say come and use spurs in Japanese? Because that would have been no, superb. No, no. Chotta mati kudasai is as far as I got, which is hang on a minute. <laughs> That's I'm all you need. Saying it, I'm <laughs> saying it to you. Oh, oh hold on. <laughs> and um but konnichiwa and all, all the normal nonsense but but i think most of the problems that the foreigners had going into japan they came in like we're foreigners our game's been going forever yours has been going such a short time professionally hmm. so we're gonna tell you aussie weren't like that at all when the time was right we i'm gonna tell you <laughs> Yeah. But most of the time, they were doing it better than we were in England. They had a full-time doctor. There's only three teams in the Premiership had a full-time doctor. Japan did. They had five different types of treatment for a player that was injured. Be it the needles in you, be it the massage, be it the special baths, be it this and be it that. In England, no, no. In lots of ways, they were more professional. Why did they have us there? They had us there for our inner football knowledge, yeah. which they couldn't possibly have got through their own experiences. Yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned a lot of the things they did there and all the different, you know, different ideas and revolutionary things. Arsene Wenger come over from there. And a lot of people now say that Arsene Wenger was revolutionary in what people are doing in the Premier League. Well, it actually, he, he accredits a lot of his kind of learning curve and his process to being in Japan. So it just shows you what, you know, what they actually were doing there. He got a lot of it from Japan. And the Japanese sort of have this unholy alliance, love affair, romance with Brazil. They think anything that's Brazilian that moves is top, top. Hmm. Mm, it's not quite right. <laughs> not quite right. But, of course, they, if, you, if you're this nation and you want to follow a nation... Perhaps Brazil's not a bad nation to follow in terms of quality and stuff. The problem that they had with that was the Japanese mentality was the complete opposite to Brazilians. <laughs> complete opposite. You know, the Brazilians could be tricky and get away with stuff and turn up late and whatever. And the Japanese would be on the money, on the mark, at the right time. Blah, blah, blah. So it's there was a sort of a, a, a mismatch. And... Um, but I still say that Aussie, when he said, we haven't got the money, we haven't got the power, we've got to be more clever. He was incredibly clever the way that he set us up to mm. teach them how to be better. And he did. And great, he did. Great times. Big success there. I know you came back over and you, and you stayed in football in, in, board, in boardroom jobs and stuff like that. And you stayed around the game. You know, you were still relatively young when you come back from there. You, you know, very young when you come back from there. Why, why did you not go back into English management and try and continue that success? Yeah, I decided that um, because of the sugar experience, mm. I was never, ever, ever, ever going to work for someone again who, because of their money and their wealth, yeah, same thing, could try and tell me, about my own world, my football world. Now, if you want to talk about business, I'll listen all day long, every day. Don't tell me about improving a player. Don't tell me who should play left back and who shouldn't. Don't, you know, <laughs> let the manager manage, the players play, the chairman chair, yeah. invest, do what you want to do, earning money. Yeah, go and do it. But 
don't get busy in my world. So um, that was the biggest, the biggest disappointment of, of all with me and Ozzy at Tottenham for the second time, they wanted to dictate football matters. No, no, you ain't got us here with our brains to dictate to us that our football brains are wrong. Don't, that don't work. And it's actually not very businesslike, which I can't quite understand. So yeah. I said, I suppose I come back with enough money from Japan because it's very well paid. I come back with enough money and I'd, I'd not satisfied my football need that I could do it, but in a way I had. Yeah. And, and I weren't ever going to work for a big business type fella again, because they think that their business ethics work in football. No. Very different thing. And um, so I moved the young girls down to uh, Devon. I sort of semi-retired. I helped Exeter City who were nigh on going out of business I worked for them for four years for nothing because they had no money. Yeah. Uh, we had a very important uh, cup draw, third round against Man United away, where they played half a team. And then with 20 minutes to go, it was nil-nil. And they decided to put on Ronaldo, Giggs and Rooney, for instance. Maybe <laughs> not quite those three, but but two of those three at least. No, no problem with them. No problem with them for Exeter. Mate. Anyway, so we, we got the nil-nil because once you're in a flow, you're in a flow. And anyway, because we got the replay live on telly, full house uh, at Exeter, 9,000-ish, um, earned a million pounds out of it, the club. So that was their safety secured. Amazing. Money-wise. And, um, and I got so much joy out of dealing with players who, to be honest, were not in the league that I played in, yep. were not even in the league that the Japanese reached. But I made it my job to help improve young players. No, that's that's where work, I got yeah. my joy from. And I'm in terms of quality of life, I couldn't have done a better thing. Hmm. Could I have earned more money if I'd have gone and listened to a chairman at wherever telling me how the left back can't play and the right back should be? Um, no. Yeah. You, 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 when you put your head on the pillow at night, you've got to sleep comfortable. And that, that's what I did. And so as good as Japan was, it gave me the right not to have to work with anyone. I chose who I wanted to work with. And there's yeah. a big difference in that when, it's, when it comes to football. And I think that part of it is getting worse and worse and worse. I think new owners have new ideas you know, managers are not given time these days. Um, you, you know, you, you look at good people like the Burnley manager, Sean Dyche, Sheffield United manager, to get them where, where they've got. But, mm. you know, if, they're, if they've got foreign owners, I don't know what they're, who they're owned by. But in a way, that job they've done to get them there, on to the next... Credit. Yeah. And and the problem I have with, with football is that these owners who live abroad have to trust someone. And if they're trusting the wrong person, it's like the blind leading the blind. Well, you could end up with a commercial director almost running the well, run, running the club. Trust me. And I, I you know, I've come for an era where Bill Nicholson and Keith Birkinshaw ran the club from top to bottom. Mm. If the laundry lady was to be given a rise, they would give it to her. That's how much they had the, the power within their hands. And um, all of a sudden that's sort of dissipated to everyone but the manager. The only power the manager's got these days is selection. Yeah. And game. when on television the other day, the new Chelsea manager decided that it put a sub on, then half hour later took him off. Now he's getting questioned. Why did you do that? Why did you bring him off? And he, he rightly said, I didn't like his body language. I didn't like this and I didn't like that. Go back to the studio. Three bodies who had never been a manager, not one of them for one game, decide that he can't manage like that. You're telling him <laughs> how to manage and who to put on and who to put off. And what's the dressing room going to think? I'll tell you what the dressing room thinks, shall I? Whew. 
I don't want to upset him. Yeah. And, and there is a need for man talk in this game that was maybe too much in our era. There's not enough of it now. Yeah. Man talk that a manager or a coach needs to have with a player to put him back on the right road. And you could point the finger at, say, Mourinho, how he's treating Deli Alley, or how he's not treated as everyone wants um, Gareth Bale. That's his only power he's got left. Trust yeah. me, the manager. I'm not talking about Jose. I'm talking about the manager. The only power you got is selection. Well, it's like you, you said about, use it. about respect before. You know, in Japan, you said you had that respect and that kind of trust from everyone. Don't really see it in the Premier League anymore. Managers come in and they don't get much time. You know, a couple of games, they come in. Look at Frank Lampard at Chelsea, just as an example. He came in, had his hands tied on transfers, brought through some young players. Everyone loved him. Frank's doing so great. How exciting. Six months later, he's, he's gone. Um, it's a tough world out there now. And that's what I wanted to answer you next, really. In that 52-year career um, as a, you know, a senior player, a manager in the, in the boardroom, what's the biggest changes that you've seen in the game, the ones that really stand out to you? Both good and bad. Yes, yeah, sure. So the pitches are magnificent these days. I, I spoke to you about the sandy beach mm. <laughs> pitches. I saw on video the other day a semi-final between Chelsea and Watford in the early 70s. FA Cup semi-final at White Hart Lane. Wow. Wow. The stand, sand on that pitch was incredible. So, billiard tables, balls that, that sort of stay the same weight throughout the game. Yeah. So they don't take in water. And by the, by the 85th minute, you edit, oh, Christ. Oh. So the, the equipment and all that stuff, although... I have to say that whenever two players clash with feet, one of them ends up sort of screaming or having the trainer on because it's obvious that the boots are that lightweight these days that any contact causes them pain. Yeah. Well, get back to the old boots then. Even if they wear a bit more, get back to the old boots. So, of course, you don't know if a player's acting or not. Um, I, I think VAR should be good but as yet isn't that good. And it creates more controversy. And the biggest problem it has, I think, is that it slows the game down. Now, when you talk about, um, and, and, and if we agree, maybe not, but if you agree that entertainment value for the supporter, the paying supporter, be it on television or in the stands, yeah. if that's important, the game is ignoring that. The VAR thing is slowing it all down. They can't even celebrate a goal now until a minute later. Yeah. Nonsense. Um, and the acceptance of the professional foul. One day, someone doing a professional foul that the pundits say, oh, yeah, he took one for the team there. One of these people that's, that's the receiver on the receiving end of a professional foul, it's going to finish his career. And then are the pundits going to smile through it? No, shouldn't be. A professional foul is not a professional foul. It's an unprofessional foul. Uh, and the other thing is game management. Game management, running the ball in the corner flag. The goalkeeper, take when his team's winning, taking a minute, minute and a half, two minutes to take a goal kick. Yeah. Do me a favour, please. If it's anti-football, it's non-football. If coaches are spending time teaching anti-football and non-football, Christ, where, where are we going? There's enough good things to teach in the game about how you move, how you beat the offside, where you run, where you check and pull out and get a bit of space there. There's so much good to teach. Why concentrate on the crap of running the clock down? And, and the pundits do not even highlight it. They're so acceptable to game management that if you're a manager or a coach that doesn't go in for game management, it's almost like you're unprofessional. Yeah. Bill Nicholson, unprofessional. Shankly, unprofessional. Jock Steen. I couldn't agree with you Do more. Do me a favour. Do I mean, me I, a favour. You just mentioned two things there. As a, as a fan, the most frustrating things to me. VAR, like you say, should, should be good. 
you know, it isn't. It's you know, the, the days when people can't celebrate for a goal because they're waiting for the decision is ridiculous. And human error should be part should be part of football. You know, it's a fan experience. But you talk about game management. I'm I'm actually glad you brought that up because it's something I watch football now. And they say, like, you know, I'm an you know, I'm an Arsenal fan. The amount of times I watch us because it's a bit of nerves, you know, winning. Well, I say the amount of times I watch us winning, not that many times now, but when I do watch us winning. And there's five, six minutes to go. And then you've got stoppage time. And already they're going, well, let's play the clock down. Let's start managing the game. And then the other team, just you inviting pressure on from the other team, piling on to you to score a goal. That's not football. I don't want to see that. And the pundits never point out when it don't work. Harry Kane got on the ball last night against Fulham and tried to sort of run towards a corner flag and lost the ball. They don't say, don't always work that game management, does it? A couple of weekends ago, Man United beat in Everton 3-2. Five minutes extra time goes up, injury time. After about two or three minutes, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer puts on a substitute. Obvious game management. He weren't injured, the, the kid coming off. Anyway, the first thing he does, the sub, is give a foul away. That free kick then goes in the box. Chest, goal, 3-3. Three, three. Surely one of them can say, see, don't always work, does it? This game yeah. management. I wonder if he'd have left that player on, whether number one, a foul had been given away, and number two, therefore, maybe that goal doesn't happen. Yeah, They never put the, the, the other side of it. Never. And that frustrates me. And maybe I'm becoming more than an ex-pro now. I'm becoming a watcher. So I'm yes. now in your territory of wanting to be entertained. And I'm worried because a lot of people I speak to, are not necessarily Spurs people, but they say, Steve, if it's not my team plan, I don't watch anymore. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> go back to my era. It's not all good in my era, but used to watch one or two internationals on a Wednesday afternoon during the season and guaranteed you'd watch the cup final. Yeah. And they were such big moments in your life. Wow. Now it's 10 a penny. And you've, you've almost seen that game before, although it's a different team playing. 85 minutes, corner flag, run it down, put a sub on. You can nominate what's going to happen next. And football shouldn't be like that. Shouldn't be like that. What happened to the days when you're winning 3-1? Guess what? Keep going with win 4-1. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And so, I... Something has got to change with regard to that. And uh, good job I'm out of it. But if I ever got back in again, and I won't because I'm retired, but I would advise, if I from afar could advise young coaches... Be careful when you're teaching anti-football because the game is too good to get anti-football. Totally agree. You're, you're capping people's talents by doing that. You're taking away people's individual ability to impress and want to go forward and attack by saying, pass it back to your keeper or grow to your corner flag. For me, I, I think you can't be more right there, mate. Um, I want to actually... I, I'm gonna to, gotta to be honest about this. I asked Steve to name his best eleven of players that he played at Tottenham and players that he's seen play at Tottenham, and he, he couldn't do it because he said he could actually name about five squads. There's been so many that are that good, so <laughs> I won't I won't put him on the spot too much. I just want to name. I want you to name a couple of those players at your time at the club and and after that really stand out as the players that you think have been inspiring and, and special playing in the Tottenham shirt. Yeah, what I've found is that. The best players, some that I'm going to name now, are also the best people. Now, I don't know if that's coincidence. but So the first one, if, if I was to pick a squad of players from the people I played with, I'd have Pat Jennings in goal and alongside him, but just a fraction behind, is Ray Clements. How lucky am I to have played with two giants of that, that goalkeeping world? And uh, Pat is so correct, so proper. Kicked the ball so well. One hand to take crosses. Always came for crosses. Never stayed on his line. And I probably put him an inch in front of, of 
Ray Clements, rest his soul. Um, because when I played with Pat, the team was in more trouble, and therefore he had more chance to save us than Ray had. Ray came yeah. in a sort of purple patch, and by the time I'd left, we were sort of still in the purple patch. So he weren't called upon so much, but could still prove what a great, great, great goalkeeper he was. So, you know, if, if you ask me on a different day, maybe I've thought a bit more and just chink it a little bit the other way. But I, I, at this particular point, Pat just slightly in front of um, Ray Clements, Cyril Knowles and Chrissy Hooten. So I'm going to swallow this one. And, uh, I was right back in the end and Chrissy was left back. So put him over to right back and bring Cyril in at left back. Cyril was undoubted quality. What a great left foot. Chrissy actually was a right footed left back and therefore, you know, can play easy as right back as he can left. And he was more, Cyril had a nasty streak in him with the opponents as you needed in that era. Chrissy was more, sort of floated over the ground and nice chap. And sometimes I'd say to a winger that was giving me trouble, why don't you go over the other side with Chrissy? You can have a nice chat for the afternoon. The 90 minutes would just fly by. And uh, because if you stay here, it probably ain't going to be that nice. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) so that's the sort of character Chrissy was. So I've managed to put them both in the team. Centre-backs in terms of squad, I'd go for Mike England. Mike England was, I tend to think about the game a little bit Brian Cluffish. Listen, you're six foot four. Edit. Your job, edit. Someone else can play. You just edit. Well, Mike was better than that, but he was a number five. You know, there was no easy of six, five or six, whatever. He was a number five and he did his job. And unfortunately, he had, had too many injuries. Uh, I think he had too many cortisone injections in his career to get him fit and stay fit because he was that important to whichever team he played for, Welsh International, of course. Um, so alongside him, I, because of my explanation, I'd want someone who could sort of play a bit more. Don't put the playing responsibility on Mike because his main job is to attack everything in the air, be it corners, mm. free kicks, long balls down the middle. So I've gone for Graham Roberts. That was an inch decision with Paul Miller. Paul was a number five, but not quite the height of Mike. So he's and not quite the football player of Graham. So he slightly misses out. Um, Graham, nice heart. Tack the ball, stick his chest out, a bit Dave Mackay-ish. If, I, if I'd have played with Dave, I'd have picked Dave, but yeah. I didn't, so I can't pick him. Um, so Graham is that type, you know, I'm here, follow me. He wasn't captain, although he was on the, the great night when we, did, we won the UEFA Cup and scored the goal to send it into extra time and then into extra time, no more goals. He was the first one to take the penalty. He led from the front, so Robbo was up and at him. Um, midfield, I got an array of talents there. I, when I got in the team, I was in the middle of Martin Peters and Alan Mullery. <sighs> what what players? What players? Mm. And, you know, the, the amount that I learned off both of those two was incredible. And then I ended up, I'm not sure I was in the middle of these two, but I was certainly seeing it was Aussie and Glenn. I've already spoken about Glenn being the best player I've ever played with. What, what a talent. And he knew where everyone was on the pitch all the time. And even good friends of mine would say, Steve, you overrate Glenn. How can you say that? He's six foot two. He never heads it. He never runs back quick enough to go. He never puts his foot in. And I'd say, well, I've got to be honest, you've ignored everything that Glenn is and has special. Mm. And Keith Birkinshaw said to me one day, I'll tell you about you, shall I, as a captain. He said, you you have a go at everyone. You even have a go at yourself. You have a go at me. The one player you don't have a go at is Glenn Oddle. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) Why is that? I said, because if I could come back as a football player, I want to be Glenn Oddle. 
And I'm so appreciative of what his skill is and the balls that he's got on the ball to play. Yes. Is just the, his eye to see the run. And so, Keith, it doesn't mean to say I don't advise Glenn. I'd say to Glenn, wait, get back a bit quicker and whatever. But I would never... Whereas you're in a meeting, you might ball someone out. I'd never ball Glenn out because he was too special. He was too... And that's not me throwing the towel in with him. It's not. But I found that the more you give Glenn, mm. I knew that Tottenham, if Glenn had had more of the ball, we'd be a better team. So my job was to get him the ball. He returned that by leading the play. I'm captain, but he led us in terms of play and um, and got back to areas where we needed him to get back to. And so when we won the ball back, I knew where he was to be able to give him and then start it off. So Aussie, magnificent player, played with his brain, um, tempo, probably never, ever passed the ball over 15 metres. Glenn was a 60-yard passer. Um, and Aussie was an, another style. Aussie did a lot of work defensively to help us out um, at the back. And I did see him kick the ball further than 15 yards one day. <laughs> he got mullered in a tackle by, a, 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 I can't remember his name. Uh, he got mullered away at Brighton. He got spanked. Whoosh. And he got up and out of anger, I thought, he must have been 40 yards from goal. I thought he kicked this ball to hit the player. <laughs> As though like hit him on the back of the head or up the arse or something. And, well, it ended up in the top corner. <laughs> and I can, I can guarantee you he didn't mean it. He was smashing the ball at this fella that had <laughs> whacked the life out of him. Anyway, so, um, Brilliant. so in amongst that, those midfield players, I mentioned four, you know, if you pick three, for instance, and one's, one's always going to be injured. Glenn's got a slight strain or, <laughs> or Aussie's on holiday in Spain. I don't know. So um, come to the front players now. Um, I should actually add to that, to that, you need a, a winger type and that would be Tony Galvin. Tony Galvin is one of my favourite people in the game. He's got such a strange northern Yorkshire humour about him. Apparently, he's got a degree in Russian. And um, now and again, you know, Keith would give all the right instructions. We're away in Europe. Calm the crowd down. Just don't do anything. Don't moan at the referee, whatever. And after two minutes, a throw-in would be given against him in a nothing area. It's not going to affect us. And he, uh, 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 and the whole crowd, 60,000 people in the San Siro or wherever, would now be on our back. Tell him, come on, use your university ex, you know, education. But, um, and now and again, we used to tell him to fuck off ski as if, as if we spoke <laughs> Russian. And, uh, but what a, what a solid player attack down the outside, get crosses in, could score and um, was a real unsung hero. I don't know if Tottenham people realised how important Tony Galvin was to our, our good team of the, the 80s, but he certainly was. And when you think they give five grand to Ghoul Town for him with another five grand if he played 10 games in the first team. So he cost the club all the 10 grand. Well, that, that's got to be the best 10 grand's worth they've ever spent. Yeah. So coming to the front, Alan Gilzine, Jimmy Greaves, Martin Chivers and Steve Archibald. Three from the older days, 70s, and one from the 80s. Um, Jimmy Greaves, I can't even tell you how good he was. Um, professional goal scorer knew exactly what the defender was trying to do to defend him and therefore yeah. waited and then cut across his line. Gilly was the master in the air and the little flick-ons for Jim. And Jimmy Greaves says Gilly was the best partner he ever had. Um, I'm not sure how Martin Chivers reacted to that shout, but anyway, Martin, I've put in as well, because Martin Chivers, two years in the 70s, when I was in the team as a youngster, 
he had such a hot spell that whenever the ball went up there and he was in, you almost didn't have to back it up. Almost as if, well, he's not going to hit the post. He's not going to hit the keeper. He's going to score. And yeah, he scored. <laughs> and I, I don't know how many, I don't know how many goals he scored, but he was, he was responsible for the League Cup wins and a UEFA Cup win in that era. And a big, strong, solid. And yeah, I, I don't know that if Martin actually believed that he was that good. I'm, um, I don't know. I, he sort of acted good in those two years, but the, the period before and the period after, he always seemed to lack a bit of confidence. One who didn't lack confidence was Archie, Steve Archibald. We'll take more care of you, Archie. And um, sharp, quick, selfish, as all front players should be, Um didn't want to lose a race in training, didn't want to, he, he was sort of a loner. And yet, you know, when it takes all types to make a team, heart, height, pace, you know, he was a bit moody, Steve. He, you know, he was that sort of different type of character and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and you know, we were a very honest team in the, in the 80s. And, um, you know, the, the players would say, Archie, you, you know, you're ever going to smile and stuff like that. But, you know, he, I think he worked off the back of having the ump. I think he played better when he had the ump. Yeah, some players need that. He, put that. he put that into, an, into the opponent, not by kicking him or whatever, but outrunning him or being a quicker reaction. And um, so, he, you know, he, he went and signed for Barcelona after he left us, and rightly so. Terry Venable spoke to me about Archie, and, and I mentioned that he's... And, and, of course, you've got to talk about all the good stuff, and he say, and Terry is, is a little bit of a loner, you know. And Terry reckons later years that he signed him because he was a loner. Because <laughs> if you're an Eng a Scottish man in Barcelona, you're probably not going to fit in that well. So you're going to have to be... <laughs> Be happy with your own um, with your own being as such. So uh, I'm sure I've left out good players out of that. And remember, I'm picking the only one I showed my hand on was was probably Mike England against Maxi and uh, Pat Jennings as against Ray Clements. And I think I'd have been a good sub for most of those players. Okay, not the front men, but the back line or the midfield line. Um, I'd have been a very acceptable sub. I'm not having that, Steve. I've got to say, that, that team you just named there, that squad you just named there, absolutely superb. I mean, that's a league-winning squad, midfield, midfield especially. Oh. But I think what's, what's, what's the incredible thing, you know, from an outsider in your career is all those players you named, you've been an integral part right in the middle of that for Spurs the whole time. And along all their careers, there you are right in the middle and then later on at the back. And it's, it just shows what an incredible achievement and incredible career you've had. And it's been... An absolute pleasure listening to you today. I mean, I haven't had to I haven't had to say too much because I've just been in awe of listening to your stories sure. from right back to the start to now and the management and stuff. And it's and it's been incredible. So I want to thank you for chatting with me today. Thank That's you. been a pleasure, Steve. I think you you need to know what you were and what you weren't, hmm. what you might have been. You know, of course, what, what would I have done different? I'd have practiced my left foot more. Um, why didn't I do that? Well, not sure, actually. Um, but uh, you end up how you end up. But you sort of got to know where you fit. Where did I fit between Mullery and Peters? They're going to, um, was it Mexico 70? Hmm. Yeah, 66 yeah. us, 70. So I'm playing with them two. And they're scoring goals in the World Cup. And then you, you're in amongst Glenn and Ozzy. Wow. How lucky are you? You find where you fit. And I think that's really important. You, you don't overcook yourself. And actually, I never talk about myself. And I've talked more about myself on this than any other time. And probably the reason is because I've written this book and... Within writing the book, you might as well tell it how it is. There's no point holding back. There's no point yeah. in saying, you know, I weren't this or I weren't that, if you thought you were that. So um, I think that writing the book was, was, was me coming to terms with 
what sort of player I was and what I weren't. And but I'm sure I thought those things at the time anyway, but never told anyone. Is the book out now, Steve? Book's out now, yes. It's called A Spur Forever. Um, I'm not a reader of books. So I'll own up to that. I've read books and of course they're great, but I'm not a great reader. And there's some pictures in the middle and you, when you get to the pictures, you think, well, where, do, where does that fit in back there? So this book, it, there's pictures accompanying all the talk, all the words, uh, the letters from scouts that want to sign me. And yeah. all that stuff behind the scenes that if you're a Spurs supporter, but even if you're a football supporter, you'd be interested. Now, a player f- came from, you know, 15 years of age in Northolt, who ended up playing the most games for Spurs. I said to Bill Nick one day, I went in his office and you had no brother, no agent, no nothing. You're there one to one. And I said to him, um, he said, what do you want? I said, uh, I'm 21, Bill, a uh, new contract. He said, what, what do you want? Well, um, I, Bill, you've picked me for three and a half years and I, um, I was really saying, you're a great manager and you've picked me for three and a half years, but <laughs> I never said it like that. You've yeah. picked me for three and a half years and um, I'm earning 28 quid a week and I've room with Gilly and I know I shouldn't know this, but he earns 95 quid a week. And I know he's a great player and I know he plays for Scotland, but I think after three and a half years, I've got to be a bit closer to them. This is your last chance. What do you want? <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what about, remember I'm earning 28. All I got out of my mouth was th- 30 pounds a week. You want 30 pounds a week to play for Tottenham Hotspur? As if, <laughs> as if. And then he said two things to me. One, he said, how many people do you actually think pay money to watch Steve Perryman play? Uh, anyway, couldn't answer that. Yeah. And then he said, and this is before video, he said, have you ever seen yourself play? <laughs> <laughs> killed you. <laughs> Just killed you. So I got the 30 quid a week. Of course I did. I, I could have got 30 quid a week if I just said, Bill, give us 30 quid a week. Yeah, go on. <laughs> you wouldn't have to take the nonsense, but I almost bought the, the, the answers coming back at me, you know, <laughs> so it, it kept you on a level and there's nothing wrong with that. And um, football, if you ask me three words that describe my feeling about football, I would say my life. Really my life. Because it is, which I've tried to relate to you. No, it's Glad you enjoyed it. Steve, it's been absolutely a pleasure. And I, you know, I'll read that book myself and I urge everyone to read it because I'm sure we've touched on some stuff today and you could go much deeper and deeper into even more, but it's superb. So I've got to say thank you again, Steve, and I hope to catch up with you soon, mate. See See you soon, soon, Steve. Bye, mate. Well done. I hope you enjoyed me chatting to Steve Perriman about his incredible career. If you'd like to hear more from us, then please like and subscribe to our pages.